Chapter Four of Black Amazon of Mars by Lee Brackett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Four. He stood in a large square lined about with huckster stalls and the booths of wine sellers. Beyond were buildings, streets, a city. Stark got a blurred impression of a grand and brooding darkness, bulking huge against the mountains, as bleak and proud as they, and quite as ancient, with many ruins and deserted quarters. He was not sure how he had come there, but he was standing on his own feet, and someone was pouring sour wine into his mouth. He drank it greedily. There were people around him, jostling, chattering, demanding answers to their questions. A girl's voice said sharply, "'Let him be. Can't you see he's hurt?' Stark looked down. She was slim and ragged, with black hair and large eyes, yellow as a cat's. She held a leather bottle in her hands. She smiled at him and said, "'I'm Thanis. Will you drink more wine?' "'I will,' said Stark, and did, and then said, uh, "'Thank you, Thanis.' He put his hand on her shoulder to steady himself. It was a supple shoulder, surprisingly strong. He liked the feel of it. The crowd was still churning around him, growing larger, and now he heard the tramp of military feet. A small detachment of men in light armor pushed their way through. A very young officer, whose breastplate hurt the eye with brightness, demanded to be told at once who Stark was and why he had come there. "'No one crosses the moors in winter.' he said, as though that in itself were a sign of evil intent. "'The clans of Mech are crossing them,' Stark answered. "'An army, to take Kushat, one two days behind me.' The crowd picked that up. Excited voices tossed it back and forth and clamored for more news. Stark spoke to the officer. "'I will see your captain, and at once.' "'You'll see the inside of a prison, more likely,' snapped the young man. What's this nonsense about the clans of Mech? Stark regarded him. He looked so long and so curiously that the crowd began to snicker, and the officer's beardless face flushed pink to the ears. I have fought in many wars, said Stark gently, and long ago I learned to listen when someone came to warn me of attack. Better take him to the captain, Lug cried Thanis. It's our skins, too, you know, if there is war. The crowd began to shout. They were all poor folk, wrapped in threadbare cloaks or tattered leather. They had no love for the guards. And whether there was war or not, their winter had been long and dull, and they were going to make the most of this excitement. Take him, Lug. Let him warn the nobles. Let them think how they'll defend Kushat and the gates of death, now that the talesman is gone. That is a lie, Lug shouted, and you know the penalty for telling it. Hold your tongues, or I'll have you all whipped. He gestured angrily at Stark. See if he is armed. One of the soldiers stepped forward, but Stark was quicker. He slipped the thong and let the cloak fall, bearing his upper body. The clansmen have already taken everything I owned, he said, but they gave me something in return. The crowd stared at the half-heeled stripes that scarred him, and there was a drawing in of breath. The soldier picked up the cloak and laid it over the earthman's shoulders, and Lug said sullenly, "'Come, then.' Stark's fingers tightened on Thanis's shoulder. "'Come with me, little one,' he whispered. "'Otherwise I must crawl.' She smiled at him and came. The crowd followed. The captain of the guards was a fleshy man, with a smell of wine about him, and a face already crumbling apart, though his hair was not yet gray. He sat in a squat tower above the square, and he observed Stark with no particular interest. "'You had something to tell,' said Lug. "'Tell it.' Stark told them, leaving out all mention of Kamar and the talesman. This was neither the time nor the man to hear that story. The captain listened to all he had to say about the gathering of the clans of Mech, and then sat studying him with a bleary shrewdness. You have proof of all this? These stripes. Their leader, Kiaran, ordered them laid on himself. 
The captain sighed and leaned back. Any wandering band of hunters could have scourged you, he said. A nameless vagabond from the gods nowhere, and a lawless one at that, if I'm any judge of men. You probably deserved it. He reached for wine and smiled. Look at you, stranger. In the Norlands, no one makes war in the winter, and no one ever heard of Chiaran. If you hoped for a reward from the city, you overshot badly. The Lord Chiaran, said Stark grimly, controlling his anger, will be battering at your gates within two days, and you will hear of him then. Perhaps you can wait for him in a cell, and you can leave Kushat with the first caravan after the thaw. We have enough rabble here without taking in more. Thanis caught Stark by the cloak and held him back. Sir, she said, as though it were an unclean word, I will vouch for the stranger. The captain glanced at her. You? Sir, I am a free citizen of Kushat. According to law, I may vouch for him. If you scum of the thieves' quarter would practice the law as well as you prayed it, we would have less trouble, growled the captain. Very well. Take the creature, if you want him. I don't suppose you've anything to lose. Lug laughed. Name and dwelling place, said the captain, and wrote them down. Remember, he is not to leave the quarter. Thanis nodded. Come, she said to Stark. He did not move, and she looked up at him. He was staring at the captain. His beard had grown in these last days, and his face was still scarred by Thard's blows and made wolfish with pain and fever, and now, out of this evil mask, his eyes were peering with a chill and terrible intensity at the soft-bellied man who sat and mocked him. Thanis laid her hand on his rough cheek. Come, she said, come and rest. Gently she turned his head. He blinked and swayed, and she took him around the waist and led him, unprotesting, to the door. There she paused, looking back. Uh, sir, she said very meekly, uh, news of this attack is being shouted through the quarter now. If it should come, and if it were known that you had the warning and did not pass it on, she made an expressive gesture and went out. Lug glanced uneasily at the captain. She's right, sir. If by chance the man did tell the truth. The captain swore. Rot! A rogue's tale. And yet... He scowled indecisively, and then reached for parchment. After all, it's a simple thing. Write it up, pass it on, and let the nobles do the worrying. His pen began to scratch. Thanis took Stark by steep and narrow ways, darkling now in the afterglow, where the city climbed and fell again over the uneven rock. Stark was aware of the heavy smells of spices and unfamiliar foods, and the musky undertones of a million generations swarmed together to spawn and die in these crowded catacombs of slate and stone. There was a house blending into other houses, close under the loom of the great wall. There was a flight of steps, hollowed deep with use, twisting crazily around outer corners. There was a low room and a slender man named Balin, vaguely glimpsed, who said he was Thanis's brother. There was a bed of skins and woven cloths. Stark slept. Hands and voices called him back. Strong hands, shaking him, urgent voices. He started up, growling, like an animal suddenly awakened, still lost in the dark mists of exhaustion. Balin swore and caught his fingers away. What is this thing you have brought home, Thanis? By the gods it snapped at me. Thanis ignored him. Stark, she said, Stark, listen. Men are coming, soldiers. Uh, they will question you. Do you hear me? Stark said heavily, I hear. Do not speak of Kamar. Stark got to his feet, and Balin said hastily, Peace. The thing is safe. I would not steal a death warrant. His voice had a ring of truth. Stark sat down again. It was an effort to keep awake. 
There was clamor in the street below. It was still night. Balin said carefully, Tell them what you told the captain, nothing more. They will kill you if they know. A rough hand thundered at the door, and a voice cried, Open up. Balin sauntered over to lift the bar. Thanis sat beside Stark, her hand touching his. Stark rubbed his face. He had been shaved and washed, his wounds rubbed with salve. The belt was gone, and his blood-stained clothing. He realized only then that he was naked, and drew a cloth around him. Thanis whispered, The belt is there on that peg under your cloak. Balin opened the door, and the room was full of men. Stark recognized the captain. There were others, four of them young, old, intermediate, annoyed at being hauled away from their beds and their gaming tables at this hour. The sixth man wore the jeweled cuirass of a noble. He had a nice, a kind face. Gray hair, mild eyes, soft cheeks. A fine man, but ludicrous in the trappings of a soldier. "'Is this the man?' he asked, and the captain nodded. "'Yes.' It was his turn to say, sir. Balin brought a chair. He had a fine flourish about him. He wore a crimson jewel in his left ear, and every line of him was quick and sensitive, instinct with mockery. His eyes were brightly cynical, in a face worn lean, with years of merry sinning. Stark liked him. He was a civilized man. They all were. The noble, the captain, the lot of them so civilized that the origins of their culture were forgotten half an age before the first clay brick was laid in Babylon. Too civilized, Stark thought. Peace had drawn their fangs and cut their claws. He thought of the wild clansmen coming fast across the snow, and felt a certain pity for the men of Kushat. The noble sat down. This is a strange tale you bring, wanderer. I would hear it from your own lips. Stark told it. He spoke slowly, watching every word, cursing the weariness that fogged his brain. The noble, who was called Rogain, asked him questions. Where was the camp? How many men? What were the exact words of the Lord Kiaran, and who was he? Stark answered with meticulous care. Rogain sat for some time, lost in thought. He seemed worried and upset one hand playing aimlessly with the hilt of his sword, a scholar's hand, without a callus on it. "'There is one more thing,' said Rogain. "'What business had you on the moors in winter?' Stark smiled. "'I am a wanderer by profession.' "'Outlaw?' asked the captain, and Stark shrugged. "'Mercenary is a kinder word.' Rogain studied the patterns of stripes on the earthman's dark skin. Why did the Lord Kiaran so called? Or do you scourged? I had thrashed one of his chieftains. Rogain sighed and rose. He stood regarding Stark from under brooding brows, and at length he said, It is a wild tale. I can't believe it. And yet, why should you lie? He paused as though hoping that Stark would answer that and relieve him of worry. Stark yawned. The tale is easily proved. Wait a day or two. I will arm the city, said Rogain. I dare not do otherwise. But I will tell you this. An astonishing, unpleasant look came into his eyes. If the attack does not come, if you have set a whole city by the ears for nothing, I will have you flayed alive, and your body tumbled over the walls for the carrion birds to feed on. He strode out, taking his retinue with him. Balin smiled. He will do it, too, he said, and dropped the bar. Stark did not answer. He stared at Balin, and then at Thonis, and then at the belt hanging on the peg, in a curiously blank and yet penetrating fashion like an animal that thinks its own thoughts. He took a deep breath. Then, as though he found the air clean of danger, he rolled over and went instantly to sleep. Balin lifted his shoulders expressively. He grinned at Thonis. Are you positive it's human? 
He's beautiful, said Thanis, and tucked the cloths around him. Hold your tongue. She continued to sit there, watching Stark's face as the slow dreams moved across it. Balin laughed. It was evening again when Stark awoke. He sat up, stretching lazily. Thanis crouched by the hearthstone, stirring something savory in a blackened pot. She wore a red kirtle and a necklet of beaten gold, and her hair was combed out smooth and shining. She smiled at him and rose, bringing him his own boots and trousers carefully cleaned, and a tunic of leather tanned fine and soft as silk. Stark asked her where she got it. Balin stole it from the baths where the nobles go. He said you might as well have the best, she laughed. He had a devil of a time finding one big enough to fit you. She watched him with unashamed interest while he dressed. Stark said, Don't burn the soup. She put her tongue out at him. Better be proud of that fine hide while you have it, she said. There's no sign of attack. Stark was aware of sounds that had not been there before. The pacing of men on the wall above the house, the calling of the watch. Kushat was armed and ready, and his time was running out. He hoped that Kiaran had not been delayed on the moors. Thanis said, I should explain about the belt. When Balin undressed you, he saw Kamar's name scratched on the inside of the boss, and he can open a lizard's egg without harming the shell. What about you? asked Stark. She flexed her supple fingers. I do well enough. Balin came in. He had been seeking news, but there was little to be had. The soldiers are grumbling about a false alarm, he said. The people are excited, but more as though they were playing a game. Kushat has not fought a war for centuries. He sighed. The pity of it is, Stark, I believe your story, and I'm afraid. Thanis handed him a steaming bowl. Here, employ your tongue with this. Afraid, indeed. Have you forgotten the wall? No one has carried it since the city was built. <laughs> Let them attack. Stark was amused. For a child, you know much concerning war. I knew enough to save your skin, she flared, and Balin smiled. She has you there, Stark. And speaking of skins, he glanced up at the belt, or better, speaking of talesmans, which we were not, how did you come by it? Stark told him. He had a sin on his soul, did Kamar, and he was my friend. Balin looked at him with deep respect. You are a fool, he said. Look, you, the thing is returned to Kushat. Your promise is kept. There is nothing for you here but danger, and were I you, I would not wait to be flayed or slain or taken in a quarrel that is not yours. Ah, said Stark softly, but it is mine. The Lord Kiaran made it so. He too glanced at the belt. What of the talesman? Return it where it came from, Thanis said. My brother is a better thief than Kamar. He can certainly do that. No, said Balin with surprising force. We will keep it, Stark and I. Whether it has power, I do not know. But if it has... I think Kushat will need it, and in strong hands. Stark said somberly, It has power, the talesman. Whether for good or evil, I don't know. They looked at him, startled. But a touch of awe seemed to repress their curiosity. He could not tell them. He was, somehow, reluctant to tell anyone of that dark vision of what lay beyond the gates of death, which the talesman of Ban Krushak had lent him. Balin stood up. Well, for good or evil, at least the sacred relic of Ban Krushak has come home. He yawned. I am going to bed. Will you come, Thanis, or will you stay and quarrel with our guest? I will stay, she said, and quarrel. Ah, well, Balin sighed puckishly. Good night. He vanished into an inner room. Stark looked at Thanis. She had a warm mouth, and her eyes were beautiful and full of light. He smiled, holding out his hand. 
The night wore on, and Stark lay drowsing. Thanis had opened the curtains. Wind and moonlight swept together into the room, and she stood leaning upon the sill above the slumbering city. The smile that lingered in the corners of her mouth was sad and far away, and very tender. Stark stirred uneasily, making small sounds in his throat. His motions grew violent. Thanis crossed the room and touched him. Instantly he was awake. Animal, she said softly, you dream. Stark shook his head. His eyes were still clouded, though not with sleep. Blood, he said, heavy in the wind. I smell nothing but the dawn, she said and laughed. Stark rose. Get Balin. I'm going up on the wall. She did not know him now. What is it, Stark? What's wrong? Get Balin. Suddenly it seemed that the room stifled him. He caught up his cloak and Kamar's belt and flung open the door, standing on the narrow steps outside. The moonlight caught in his eyes, pale as frost-fire. Thanis shivered. Balin joined her without being called. He, too, had slept but lightly. Together they followed Stark up the rough-cut stair that led to the top of the wall. He looked southward, where the plain ran down from the mountains and spread away below Kushat. Nothing moved out there. Nothing marred the empty whiteness. But Stark said, They will attack at dawn. End of chapter 4